Imagine a world where the first moon landing was not the peak of NASA's achievements, but just the first step in humanity's epic journey into outer space. By the 70s and 80s, we had hundreds of people living and working on the moon. By the 90s, we'd landed on Mars and begun to colonize a new planet. There's an alternate timeline somewhere out there in the multiverse where humanity is experiencing the roaring 2020s on Saturn's moon Titan, instead of whatever the hell we're doing out here right now. And at the heart of it all would be one monstrous rocket, a space launch vehicle so awesome and powerful that the ground we walk on could not withstand its force. From the depths of the ocean would rise the greatest rocket ever conceived, the Sea Dragon. This is the Space Race. The Sea Dragon was actually one of the first legitimate rocket designs ever drafted for NASA. This thing dates back to 1962, and it was drawn up by Robert C. Truax, who was a pioneering engineer in the field of liquid-fueled rocket motors during the late 1930s, and a U.S. Navy officer who spent two years at sea on an aircraft carrier. So this guy was the real deal. He wasn't just dreaming up rocket fantasies, he really knew what he was talking about. The concept was for a two-stage, sea-launched, super-heavy-lift orbital rocket. The plan was to make this rocket as simple as possible, while at the same time being overwhelmingly powerful and effective at getting massive payloads into space. The proposed dimensions were 150 meters in length and 23 meters in diameter. No rocket built up to this day has been anywhere near that size, even among rockets that have been fully conceived but not built Sea Dragon is by far the largest. Conceived by legitimate rocket scientists, that is. Apparently my spaceship designs from grade school don't count. The largest rocket constructed to date is the SpaceX Starship. That is 120 meters tall, which is pretty close, but the Starship is only 9 meters in diameter. So to visualize a Sea Dragon, you'd have to imagine Starship at 2.5 times the width. The closest thing we've ever seen in real life would be the old Soviet N-1 rocket, which had a 17 meter wide thrust section. The N-1 was cone shaped though, so it tapered down to the width of a normal rocket by the time it reached the upper stage. But the base was ultra wide to accommodate the 30 individual rocket engines. That Block A first stage on the N-1 is technically still the most powerful rocket to ever lift off, making around 10.2 million pounds of thrust, topping even the 8.5 million pounds of the SLS. But we never tend to count the N-1 because the furthest they ever got was exploding in mid-air 12 kilometers above the ground. Every N-1 ever tested blew up. When the SpaceX Super Heavy Booster launches the Starship, it will make around 17 million pounds of thrust if all 33 Raptor engines burn at full throttle. But the Sea Dragon would decimate all, kicking out 79 million pounds of thrust from one epic, monolithic, big-ass rocket engine, giving it the capability to put 550 metric tons of cargo in low Earth orbit, and just like the Starship, Sea Dragon was conceived with a fully reusable first and second stage. So, this is the kind of rocket that would have been able to deploy an entire space station in one launch. It could have put a full year's worth of supplies and building materials onto the moon in a single mission. This would have comfortably ferried 100 or more people to Mars at a time. But could any of that have ever been real life, or is this all just one big fantasy? Let's get into how the Sea Dragon would have actually worked. So, being a naval officer, Robert Truax took a lot of inspiration from the way that giant ships are constructed. So, the components for Sea Dragon would have been built at a shipyard and then deployed directly into the ocean. It's probably the only way that you could reasonably construct something so large. There would be no way to transport such massive rockets over land, and the buoyant environment would support the massive structures and prevent them from crumpling under their own weight. There's another important reason that the Sea Dragon needed to be a water-based launch vehicle. Its engine was simply too powerful for any solid ground to withstand. The engine powering the Sea Dragon has come to be known as the Big Dumb Booster. If the Starship Super Heavy is an F1 car, then the Sea Dragon Booster would be the Dodge Charger from the Fast and Furious, with a giant supercharged engine sticking up out of the hood, just unsophisticated, 
brute force. That engine was designed to be fueled by RP-1, which is a refined kerosene that's still very popular as a modern rocket fuel. Falcon 9 burns RP-1, and that would be mixed with the traditional cryogenic liquid oxygen. The fuel delivery system for this engine was a bipropellant pressure-fed cycle. That means that there are no pumps or gas generators involved in moving the fuel from the tank to the combustion chamber. It is all done using pressure. That means virtually zero moving parts involved, aside from a couple of valves. This is pretty near the most simple way to fuel a rocket engine. The only way it could get any easier would be to use hypergolic propellants, which are fluids that will spontaneously combust on contact with each other, and that means you don't even need an igniter in the combustion chamber. Having said that, no pressure-fed rocket booster has ever escaped Earth's gravity and reached orbit. You can use a pressure-fed engine once you get into space, but at sea level they are too restricted by physics. To make this work, you need to place pressurant tanks above the main fuel tanks. When you open the valve to release the pressure out into the fuel tank, that will push the fuel towards the engine, where a second valve will control the flow into the combustion chamber. So, the amount of pressure you can build in the combustion chamber is limited by the amount of total pressure you can contain in that top pressurant tank. And that means the engine can only burn as long as the top tank can maintain a higher pressure than the fuel tank. After that point, the flow just stops moving. Like when you release a balloon full of air, as soon as the pressure inside the balloon equalizes the ambient air pressure, it loses thrust. Truax's design was to have an RP-1 tank pressure of 470 psi and an oxygen tank pressure of 250 psi, providing a chamber pressure of 290 psi at liftoff. So, to achieve all that, you would need an exponentially higher pressure in the top pressurant tanks. The only way to increase the amount of pressure your tank can hold is by making it stronger, which therefore means making the walls thicker, which therefore means making the tank larger, and the larger your tank gets, the larger your rocket needs to be. Most rocket scientists looked at this equation and concluded that it was just not possible. But in Truax's mind, he just kept scaling up his rocket to a larger and larger size until he made the physics work for him. But even at the epic proportions of the Sea Dragon, his main engine could only burn for 81 seconds before the pressure dropped too low, and that would only get the rocket to a height of 25 miles, which is far short of a typical main engine cutoff. The Falcon 9 first stage separation happens at 50 miles above the surface. At main engine cutoff, the Sea Dragon is already traveling at 4,000 miles per hour, but it's only getting started. The first stage separation reveals yet another humongous single rocket motor. This one is powered by liquid hydrogen and oxygen, also pressure fed and still reaching 13 million pounds of thrust. This engine would feature an expanding bell so the cone would stretch out as it flew, increasing the expansion ratio from 7 to 1 to 27 to 1, increasing the performance along the way. This burn would last 260 seconds and take the second stage Sea Dragon to 142 miles in altitude, which is high enough for a sustained orbit. And it's this vulgar display of raw power that required the Dragon to launch from sea. The thrust energy of that main engine would have torn a concrete launch pad to shreds, melted down any steel launch tower, and sent out an eardrum-shattering sound wave for miles in every direction. The plume of fire and exhaust gas coming out of the Dragon as it flew would have been one mile long. So the idea for launch was to float the two stages of the rocket into a lagoon at Cape Canaveral, where the final assembly of the Sea Dragon would take place. Then the rocket would be fully fueled and pressurized at the Cape before being towed out to sea about 35 miles away from shore. When they reached the launch point, ballast tanks at the bottom of the rocket would be filled to tip it upright and float on the sea, with just the nose sitting above the waterline. From there, the launch procedure is not that different from one on the ground. The ballast tanks are released as the main engine is fired up. Remember that the oxygen for combustion comes from the liquid oxidizer tank. If you can burn a rocket engine in space, you can burn one underwater just the same. With the biggest difference being side-mounted thrusters that keep the Dragon upright as it emerges from the sea. Truax even had a crazy idea to make this rocket fully reusable. Now, obviously a propulsive landing like the one used by SpaceX would be totally out of the question here for so many reasons that we won't bother to list them all, but Rob did come up with a scheme that the first stage would deploy a kind of inflatable drag chute 
and would slow it down enough to allow the rocket to fall softly into the ocean, where it could be recovered and towed back to the Cape for refurbishing. Truax even thought that the second stage could be recovered, but I can't wrap my brain around any scenario where that could even be possible. It's just so big. How could you possibly stop that from burning up on re-entry? If you think you know, drop your idea in the comments. So yes, this was an insane idea, but it was a legitimate plan for getting huge quantities of mass to orbit. Something that Elon Musk always talks about to this day is mass to orbit. In his mind, this is the most critical factor for expanding human life into outer space. We need to get large quantities of stuff into orbit. This is why SpaceX developed their Starship, and even with its incredible power, that Starship will only carry one-fifth of the cargo capacity of the Sea Dragon. SpaceX is compensating for that by making the Starship rapidly reusable and building a very large fleet of rockets. But if we sit here and imagine what human civilization could have been if the space race hadn't been abandoned by the late 1960s, if NASA's funding had continued to rise instead of being cut down more and more as the years progressed, could we have fulfilled that old dream of becoming a spacefaring, multi-planetary species by the dawn of the 21st century? Obviously, there are a lot of factors in play, and we'll never know for sure. The truth is, probably not. But if we had a rocket like the Sea Dragon providing the backbone for a well-funded space program, then we definitely would have had a shot at making it. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.